Australopithecus sediba. It was a strange creature. No one had ever seen anything like this. It had a very derived face, of advanced dentition, somewhat like a human's, a very small brain, ape-like arms. What do you mean a derived face? It means a, a face that's moving more towards our kind of face and away from the, the pr prognathic pronounced faces of these earlier ancestral hominids like Lucy and, and these other forms. And the and, arms? And the arms were very long, but the hands were more human-like. How tall? Uh, maybe 1.3 meters, very small, very small bodied. Um, the legs were elongated a little bit. The pelvis was like ours, but the feet were bizarre with a heel like a chimpanzee and a midfoot that was more like a human. No one had ever seen anything like it. Walking on two legs, walking on two legs, definitely somewhere in our family tree. We didn't know where uh, and still don't because what it taught us was that we've been missing things that were right in front of our eyes. It, would turn into what we thought was the richest collection of early hominins on the continent of Africa until four weeks ago. Until four weeks ago from right now. Yeah. Ten days ago, I was unpacking tents from one of the largest expeditions ever mounted to recover early hominids on the continent of Africa that I launched over a period of three weeks. Uh, after seeing a photograph delivered by my explorers who had gone down into a tiny crevice, the most amazing, risky thing probably anyone's done for this science, had gone down into a seven inch slot, 30 meters underground, after traveling through this torturous cavern to get there, and there they saw some fossils lying on the surface. They did not have a camera with them. Out they came, they went back in the next weekend, came out, had photographs, they showed up at my house at 9.30 p.m. on the 1st of October and said, you're going to want to see what we've got. I opened that laptop and saw the most amazing images I'd ever seen in my career. There on the screen was first an image lying on the soft dirt of a hominid mandible with all the teeth intact. A jawbone. A jawbone. It was primitive. I could see it was, it was clearly with an ancient early human. Next to it, the next slide showed me body parts. It was a humerus, this bone here, a leg bone, fragments of other parts. Part of a skeleton was seen there. The third slide was a skull, or at least half of one. I could see lying in the dirt the outline of the front of a face, top of a skull, and the back of one. I was blown away. Firstly, we don't see that kind of thing in, in the Southern African contract. All of our fossils come from hard rock, concrete-like rock we call breccia. They take thousands and thousands of hours to prepare. I'd spend, my teams had spent as much as 45,000 hours preparing those two skeletons from Malapa. Huge amount of effort. I was looking at one sitting in soft dirt, albeit 30 to 40 meters underground. It staggered me. I had to call National Geographic at 2 AM because I, I said, I got to do something about this. And the vice president of National Geographic said on the phone to me, he said, after listening to me, probably sighing, <laughs> he, said, he said, do what you need to do. You were finding a lot of more fossils than you'd ever seen before at once? Um, certainly it's the most fossils of a hominid I'd ever seen on the surface at one time. My first thoughts went to, it's another Sediba situation, or it's more like Lucy. Because I could see in these photographs almost as many bones, if not as many bones, as were associated with the famous Lucy discovery, which is one of the most complete early hominids ever discovered. I could see them. I knew it was, I knew it was going to be whatever it was. It'd be spectacular, but I needed to see it myself. Right. But I knew that I could not get through what they described, a seven inch gap. My uh, physique is not of that nature, but my 15 year old son's is. And Matthew has had a great deal of experience in the field. He knows what these things look like. So over that next week, I taught him to work with my cameras, it's got scales, and we talked about how we could get scale, proper scale photographs. And so the next weekend we went out there, Steve and Rick, who'd gone down this cave, took me up this incredible climb, 200 meters in the cave, as extreme caving as I had ever done to get there. 
up these gaps, over these large falls, these crevasses, and I leaned into this little shaft and looked down into the darkness, and then I sent my 15-year-old son down. Uh, and he, Rick and Steve, went down, and I sat there alone in the dark, thinking. I was 20, 30 meters underground, waiting for them to come back. And a long time went by, more than an hour, and I hear scrambling coming up, and Matthew's head emerges with the helmet and the light out of this little crevasse. He's grinning. And I know I probably get Worst Parent of the Year award, but I didn't go, are you OK? I went, and? And he looked up at me, and he said, Daddy, it's wonderful. He said, it was so beautiful, my hands were shaking for three minutes before I could even take a picture. And he had taken magnificent pictures of something that was as extraordinary as it looked in those first photographs of those fossils. Tell us about the Facebook. Next day was Sunday, October the 10th, and I decided I needed special people to get down there, people with special skills. So I did what anyone would do. I put an ad on Facebook. I put an ad out saying I needed skinny people with a master's or PhD in paleoanthropology, archaeology, or paleontology who could work underground and had skills in excavations and could work as a team in a stressful environment. And I put that out there thinking there were probably two or three people on this planet that might be qualified to do this job. Ten days later, I had 57 applicants, 80% of which were young women, all qualified. It was extraordinary. I was blown away. I was then beginning to design an expedition. I knew I was going to use technology. I designed remote cameras that could go in there. I had to get cabling, three kilometers of cabling to do the system. I'm friends with Bob Ballard and James Cameron. I learned a lot from their remote operated vehicles that they do under sea. So I was going to design the same sort of system, except I was going to have remote operated little people who could work in that system and get down into that cave. I did communications, intercom systems, safety equipment, and pulled together a team of, of 50 to 60 people over the next three weeks. And on November 7th, we landed on site. We, we called it the Rising Star Expedition, because that's the name of the chamber that runs next to this, this particular chamber. November 10th, Everything was in place to go in, and I dropped these magnificent six young women into that cave. The first three went in. We had an alarm go off with a gas monitor that malfunctioned. They, they had begun scanning with these incredible technology, scanning technology to map the floor of this cave. Out they came in what we thought was an emergency, and they brought the first fossil out. They had it. And it was that mandible. And it was incredible, and it didn't look like anything I thought it was going to look like. It was certainly an early hominid, but it was much smaller than I thought. It had some different morphologies that I couldn't see until I had that 3D thing in my hand. The next morning, we went back in to start recovering more of this skeleton of an early hominid. By the first bag of fossils that came out, I knew we were not recovering a skeleton of an early hominid. We were recovering skeletons. There were two right femurs. By the next bag of fossils, I knew we were not recovering two early hominids. We were recovering three. By that afternoon, I knew it was more than three and of all kinds of ages. And in the next three weeks, we recovered more early hominids than I had seen in my entire life. More than 1,200 elements of dozens of individuals. The richest early hominid site discovered in the history of the search for human origins on the continent of Africa.